That's much better on our. Do we need to have that microphone changed later then? No, we can hear you fine now. We just have to increase the volume on our end. Yeah. Oh, okay. That's good. Well, that's good. That's yeah. And you can hear us fine now? Yeah, we can. And did we get a test on someone from the tele on the telephone? Yes, they responded. No, no, we can't hear. Can someone on the telephone just do another test for us to see if we can hear at Las Vegas? We're here. Did you hear that we're here? No. Can we try it one more time, please? Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, so, so we can hear you in Carson City. I'm not sure they can hear you in Henderson. Uh, we may have okay, we'll just have to, when we have somebody speaking on the telephone and when Dr. Uh, Klein joins us, we're going to have to make sure everybody's pretty quiet so we can hear whatever that conversation is. So uh, do we have uh, anyone from the AG's office sitting with you there? We do. Mr. Belcourt's here. Okay. Oh, hi, Dennis. How are you? Thank you for I'm being fine. with us today. Thank you. All right, so we are past the time. We're at 1.32, so why don't we go ahead and get the meeting started today. Um, this is a properly noticed meeting for the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange. Um, we're video conferencing from our new office here in Henderson. Uh, it's over on Stephanie Way, and the call center is located here. And we're connecting with the uh, administrative office of in Carson City. And so I want to welcome everyone here today. Um, as a reminder, as Mr. Hager and I always do, if you are joining us on the phone, if you would please put your phone on mute so we don't pick up on any background noise from you. And then also um, to help us along, if you have to leave the line, please don't uh, put us on hold that disrupts uh, a lot of the meeting when that happens. And so, uh, Mr. Hager, do you have any other announcements? Not yet. Okay, and Ms. Roos, do you have any announcements for down here? I do, I do. Um, so if you need to go to the restroom here at this location, it is a little bit different than in the north. Um, they are very, very careful with who gets to use the restroom here, so you have to have the key. Um, so out on the front desk, there is a blue key and a red key. The red is for the women's bathroom, the blue key is for the boys' bathroom. And they are down the hall, so make sure you take your key. Um, so bring it back. And bring it back. <laughs> we didn't quite put a big tire on it, but yeah, it does have a big handle on it, so I don't think you'll want us to get in your purse. So. All right, thank you very much for that. And then, Mr. Hager, do you want to have uh, conduct a roll call, please? Uh, sure. Ms. Johnstone, I believe, indicated she would be absent today. Uh, Ms. Lewis? Here. Dr. Klein, I believe he'll be about 30 minutes late on the phone. Uh, Ms. Kerr? Here. Dr. Ford? Here. Uh, Director Wilden? See. He is not here yet. Uh, Commissioner Kipper uh, is not here yet. And Director Mullenkamp I, is not here yet. Uh, Vice Chair Atkins? Here. And Chair Campbell? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you very much. Um, that leads us to agenda item number two, which is public comment. Um, I'll start in Carson City. Do we have any public comment? It does not appear so. Okay, and how about here in Henderson? Good afternoon, members of the board. For the record, my name is Barry Gold. I'm the Director of Government Relations for AARP Nevada. And what I'd like to talk about for a moment is on the marketing um, efforts that are being undertaken by HealthLink and the Navigators. AARP convened um, two meetings, one in the south and one in the north, and invited HealthLink and the Navigator groups and a lot of community groups, members of Congress, disease-specific groups, social service agencies, to talk about who they were reaching out to and who they were marketing to. And it became clear that no one was reaching out to the over 50 besides AARP. When I came to a meeting a couple times ago, I looked at the KPS3 marketing plan and it did not include any target markets for people over the age of 50. Now, it did talk about the sick and the worried. 
and I was assured by someone, oh, well, they're covered under that. Well, since then, um, I've talked to people in KPS3, I've talked to the navigator groups, and they are not. They are not. They told me they are not marketing people over the age of 50. It's not part of their group. They're looking at schools and people like that. The reason why I mention this is um, I've been to several events, community events, where Nevada Health Link or the navigators were conspicuously absent. I'm going to repeat that, conspicuously absent. And they really could have been there. It was an opportunity where a lot of people were there. AARP, I'm glad we brought at least 100 of your brochures that we were able to give out. But you could have given out a lot more at Senior Event, Senior Fest. Senior Fest is the largest senior event in Reno. So over 4,000 seniors. When I talked to Chris McMullen, we figured HealthLink would be there. He told me that he talked to someone, I don't know who he talked to, or HealthLink or the Navigator Groups, who turned him down and said, no, thank you. He was going to offer them a great 4,000 seniors. Uh, another one was the Aging and Disabilities Conference just uh, two weeks ago. Now, the Aging and Disabilities Conference, it's a misnomer. They're no longer just the Aging Conference. It's Aging, Disabilities, Early Intervention. It's a birth to death conference. I was told again that someone turned down a booth to be there. So your marketing efforts are kind of missing the mark. Um, now, I talked to John Hager about this at a, at a Dina Titus event, and he mentioned I will note that and consider that. But I think that's something that's really important. I think everyone would agree that the 50 plus really are the ones who really need insurance. Those are the people who probably have pre-existing conditions and have not been able to get insurance. Those are the people who may be underemployed and may need um, the subsidies. So AARP cannot be the only ones reaching out to these people. We cannot be the ones going out. We've entered into a great partnership with the Clark County and the Henderson Libraries and we're doing presentations to all age groups. I was at the Las Vegas Library last week. There was a 25-year-old woman with three kids already. I talked to her about Medicaid. There was a 35-year-old guy who needed subsidies. I talked to him about that. We all need to be talking to everyone. Now, the Medicare people are probably the most scared because they think they're going to lose what they have. Now, should KPS3 and the Navigators be spending a lot of their efforts reaching out to these Medicare people? Perhaps not. There's other important target markets that you reach to, and AARP will look after some of those people. But the 50 to 64-year-olds absolutely need to be part of the marketing efforts, and I guess what I'm saying um, is I'm asking the board and the staff to strongly encourage KPS3 and the navigators to include them in their marketing efforts and also the events that they choose to go to, because as I mentioned before, there was a conspicuous absence at a couple of these. A lot of the other community agencies were wondering, gee, why isn't anyone here? So that's my piece on that. The other piece, and there's one more, and then it's my time to talk, is um, the ads. I've been watching the ads, and I have the privilege of seeing what some of the other ads are in some of the other states, and you know, some of them are funny, some of them are this and that. But they have a negative tone. I think some of you have seen that. Every single one, the thing that jumps out is avoid it a fine on your insurance. Avoid a fine on your insurance. It's a kind of a heavy-handed message, and I think most of the people in this room would agree that while that is true, that is not the reason we want everyone to sign up for insurance. So those are just my two public comments. One is about the negative tone of the ads, and the other, probably more that I'd like to stress even more, is that the marketing efforts of the 50 plus, the 50 to 64 especially, be included in the marketing efforts by KPS3 and the navigators. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Mr. Gold, and um, I'm sure the board will um, would like to have Mr. Hager give a report back on some of your comments. Uh, do we have anyone else here in Henderson? And can we note for the record that Commissioner Kipper is here? Okay, thank you. Welcome, um, Mr. Kipper. Um, I'm going to ask for public comment from the telephone and let's see how well we can hear if there's someone that wants to participate. Is there anybody on the yes. telephone that would like to make some public comment? I'm not just hearing confirm, Just confirm, can I get one person to say hello? Hello. All right. Hello. Okay. And there's no public comment on the phone, Madam Chair. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, let's move on to the approval of minutes from the September 12th meeting. Does anyone have any edits, corrections, or amendments that they'd like to make to those uh, minutes? Hearing none, um, may I have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. And is there a second? 
Is that you, Ms. Kerr? That was. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and second uh, for approval of the minutes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries. All right, Mr. Hager. Ron, let's uh, get our executive director's report. I, I'll bet you have a lot to talk to us about since we've had October 1st come and go. What a ride it has been. Um, for the record, John Hager, executive director for the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange. Uh, and we at the exchange are very pleased to be past 10-1, to be on this side of 10-1. Um, so, so first couple items, the proposed regulations. Uh, the first two proposed regulations uh, have actually been published now in the federal registration. Comments are due November 8th. We're still reviewing whether or not we want to comment on them. Uh, the regulations regarding members of Congress and congressional staff on the exchanges was finalized um, and published on October 2nd. Um, so, so basically what we're, we're in the process of doing now is the transition from implementation, we've been talking about implementation now for two years, to, to operations. Uh, we went live um, with NevadaHealthLink.com at 8.17 Pacific Standard Time uh, on October 1st. The 17 minute delay was caused by a last minute planned data synchronization process to ensure that all planned data updated the night before was included in the operational platform. The system ran fairly smoothly for about a, a half hour to an hour. However, the high web traffic um, and we received in the in the nine o'clock, ten o'clock, and eleven o'clock hours, uh, 4,500 user unique visitors, 6,000 6, unique visitors, and another 4,500 unique visitors. So it was uh, quite busy for that morning, um, and uh, that combined with a coding error that did not allow each of our ten servers to share in an equal load of the web traffic caused the account creation functionality to shut down intermittently. We fixed that at about 1 p.m. Uh, that day, and then uh, and then we create we we implemented another fix to to fix a less frequent issue that was related to that. So things ran um, a little more smoothly the the next day. Um, uh, now I will say on the so call volume in addition to the web traffic, our, our call volume was pretty excessive as well. We had in the first four hours we received 947 calls. The average time on each call was approximately 23 minutes. And that's what, without people trying to enroll in plans, it was, it was simply information gathering at that point. Um, a firewall issue prevented us from transferring calls to our overflow call center uh, for most of the morning, causing excessive wait times. By the afternoon, the firewall issue was fixed, reducing the abandonment rate to about 1.8% <clears throat> and time to answer uh, to about 30 seconds. So our statistics on um, October 1st, we received about 1,800 calls. We had 35,000 unique visitors to our website. 113,000 find a plan views, 57,000 user registration views, and 17,600 accounts that were created um, during that time. Now, a creation of an account is not an application. It's simply creating the online account to, um, to let a person create the application. Uh, a lot of those people have uh, created accounts uh, to, view the, to view the plan and to view their subsidies. Uh, but it doesn't mean that they actually went through the entire process. Um, uh, many of those folks are working through the process. Um, overall, reaction to the opening seemed to be positive, and uh, we've, I've got at the end of this comments to the press that were given to the press at the 8 a.m. press briefing. Um, I think people have been fairly understanding of the fact that, that this is an, an extremely complex build. Um, a build like this typically typically is done in about three years, and uh, Xerox did it in about a year. Uh, it's not done yet. There are things that we are still working on to, to complete it, but, um, but overall the functionality is, is proceeding. Um, there, that said, um, there, there was some frustration. You know, People were very anxious to get enrolled in coverage, and the message on the first, and it, has, it continues to be, um, the deadline to enroll for January 1st is December 15th. It is not necessary to enroll today. Uh, you've got, um, I believe, 65 days from now to, to enroll by January 1st. So there's still plenty of time. Uh, enrolling today won't get you any further along in the process than enrolling in another week or two. So, um, so, so first of all, we, we, um, we ask for continued patience to work through some of the remaining issues that we have. Um, the system is getting better, but there will continue to be issues for, for some time, and we'll, and we'll work through those issues. Um, the other thing that was really interesting about that day is, is that we also received calls where people were, um, were overjoyed that they could actually get insurance now 
um, that they were actually uh, in tears on the phone with us. It was actually difficult to continue to meet our performance statistics in the call center because it's difficult to tell a person who is sobbing that they're so happy to have insurance, hey, sorry, i got to get to the next call. And so that, was, that accounted for some of the uh, excessive time uh, on the phones. Uh, but uh, there were a lot of very happy people that, that could actually access insurance. They were happy about that. Um, on October 2nd, we identified an error that prevented consumers from getting through the account creation process. Uh, the uh, Division of Welfare and Support Assist Services and the exchange team identified the cause of the error uh, on the morning of October 3rd. We had a partial fix uh, push to production that night, and uh, which, which significantly increased, in, improved our, um, our, uh, our system usage. And then finally, it was fully resolved on October 6th. The Federal Data Services Hub, a lot of, a lot of attention has been given to that, and whether or not it's working or, or not working. Um, it appears to be operating as advertised, I would say, um, near real time, not completely real time. Um, during, during low volume times, it, it does seem to give us pretty immediate responses. Uh, high volume times, there are delays at times. We had our timer set to uh, 30 seconds, so when you click between our web pages, if there is a response that was greater than 30 seconds, we basically say, you know, hey, we're timed out, come back later. Um, that caused uh, more people to get kicked out of the system than what we would have liked, so we increased that timer to 60 seconds, and uh, for the most part, most people are getting through those processes. So when, the, when our system accesses the hub, we're getting a response, and, um, and, it is, um, and, and it's coming back. Now, I will say that if you are going through a web portal, and response time or movement to the next screen is more than 20, sec 20 seconds. It seems like an eternity, um, so it's it's not ideal. Um, but but uh, but we are getting responses. Um, it's not the you know we, we had uh, concerns a year ago that the response time would be 24 hours, and that's not the, that's certainly not the case. We are getting responses. Um, now we we. Uh, <clears throat> We have been told that uh, an upgrade to the federally facilitated marketplace um, that was scheduled for earlier this week would improve hub performance. Now, those are two separate systems, so the only way we, that we could see that that would affect hub performance is that perhaps the federally facilitated exchange is not pinging the hub so much, and since they represent 35 states, uh, fewer pings means that it opens up bandwidth for the rest of us to get in there. So, um, so I, I have not been able to confirm uh, since that, that, um, that push has been made uh, whether or not hub performance has, has increased since we wrote this uh, report on Tuesday. Um, the information exchanges between the front end Nevada Health Link portal and the back end eligibility engine are working well. There are minor issues that are preventing certain applications from automatically being received at the Division of Welfare and Supportive Services. However, we have a process, a nightly process, where we compare the databases and catch the missing applications which are then sent over in batch. So um, from everything that we've seen, everything that we have sent over is being um, received by DWIS, uh, whether that is uh, immediately during the application um, while the person is at the web portal or if that happens that night, they are all going over. Um, we have been uh, coordinating our, our build. The, the, our system is typically scheduled to be down between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Um, we had uh, quite a few more days that it was down. I think we did uh, a couple over the weekend um, uh, to fix the, the issues that we find. Um, as individuals and brokers report issues to us, we are identifying the causes of, the, of those issues, um, creating the, the fix in our test environment during the day and then pushing those for, to production during our nightly maintenance window and then testing them to make sure that, that uh, things are working smoothly. Um, and every day I'd say we have a list of about, oh, I don't know, 10 to 20 items that, um, that uh, come out uh, that, that are scheduled for a fix overnight. Uh, we, we look at those the next day and I'd say about 90% of those things um, are fixed each night and we go back and, and look at the other 10%, figure out um, what we need to do and, and those are usually fixed within the next build cycle. So uh, we're making progress. Um, it, it, it has not been without challenges. It is, a, a, again, a, an extremely complex build. So anybody thought that thought that this would be perfectly smooth on October 1st um, has, has never been a part of an IT experience. The other thing that is, is interesting, um, you know, we get comparisons to uh, other organizations like <clears throat> Apple or Microsoft, and when they have a build that is going to go to production, 
Nobody knows when that thing is coming till a couple of weeks, maybe a month beforehand. They announce the date a month beforehand. Yep, we're ready to go for, to production. And so most of the issues <clears throat> that, that occur are already fixed or are in the final testing phases by the time you get to that announcement. <clears throat> we do not have that luxury here. Uh, we were told a year ago, or maybe, maybe earlier than that, that October 1st was the deadline. And so we had uh, no ability to push back that, that schedule. Uh, we've gone live. Um, so I uh, have been very pleased and impressed with um, our vendors and with our staff and the mountain of work um, that has been done uh, by, by all parties. Uh, our sister agencies, the Division of Insurance, has done a ton for plan certification, getting the plans uh, up and ready. Uh, the Division of Welfare and Supportive System, Welfare and Supportive Services, has had an army of folks working on this project. Um, our, our staff here, the Xerox team, um, the Xerox team alone, I believe, put in well over 150,000 hours of, of work in this project. Uh, that does not include the eligibility engine and all the staff time uh, from the state employees. So uh, several hundred thousand hours of work have gone into this project, and uh, I really appreciate all the work that everybody's put into it. Um, I, I, we need to commend staff uh, from all of these different agencies and vendors uh, to you know, be able to work together like this has been a, a truly amazing process. Um, so the, the broker and navigator communities have been extremely eager to use the system and, and we, we can't blame them. They want to help um, get people enrolled and, uh, and I, they're very excited to do that. We have uh, 1,650 brokers that have indicated their intent to sell. Um, a good portion of those are have been trained uh, by by the exchange staff as well as the 110, I believe, navigators, enrollment assisters, plus another 100 certified application counselors. Um, uh, most of them have been trained as well. Um, most of the ones that have not been trained have either signed up with us late um, or have not completed their certification process with the Division of Insurance. Uh, we continue to offer courses to those that need them to make sure that they are uh, able to use our system. Um, that said, there are some, there have been some issues with the broker portal. Uh, we we think that we have um, fully resolved one of the major issues with that last night, and so uh, brokers are are um, should be getting their codes to create their accounts um, within the next few days. Um, and uh, so so hopefully uh, by the beginning of next week. Um, our brokers will be um, out there in force, our navigators will be out there in force and enrolling folks. Um, we also have been working with the carriers to, to correct various display issues. Uh, a, a prime example of a display issue there, when you, when you look at the plans <clears throat> up in the very top of, uh, when you compare our three plans together, uh, it will say dental, um, or dental and vision covered, yes, no, and, and for vision it says no. Um, well, that really is adult vision is no. You go down to the bottom, the, the pediatric vision is covered, and you can see what the benefits are for the pediatric vision. Um, so I believe last night a, uh, a change was made to say, okay, adult vision covered, and the answer is no, depending on the, on the carrier what, um, what they might cover. So, um, so there are things like that that, have, we have been, that the carriers have been identifying, we've been working with, uh, to, with them to, to resolve those issues. Uh, and, and when I mentioned all the staff and the vendors working on this, the carriers have been uh, spending a significant amount of time working through our system and making sure their plans are accurate, displayed appropriately, that the rates are correct, et cetera. And they continue to work with us, so we really appreciate their partnership. Um, as of 8 o'clock, um, I'm sorry, as of 4 p.m. on October 8th, uh, we have, our call center has received about 1,800 calls. We've had 90,000 unique visitors on our site, a uh, quarter of a million plan views, 170,000 user registration views, uh, well over half a million single streamlined application views. We have created, uh, or there have been 22,000 accounts that have been created. We've had 3,600 Medicaid APTC applications that are in process. 2,300 Medicaid or APTC applications that have been submitted without a plan selection. 703 applicants have completed plans, plan selections, representing, 100, eight, excuse me, representing 806 <coughs> future exchange members. And I say future um, because they are not actual exchange members until they are until they actually pay for 
um, the coverage. <clears throat> Those payments are starting to trickle in. I think they started on, on Wednesday. And uh, we expect to see that grow in volume significantly as we get toward November. Um, as we've indicated in the past, uh, we expect, um, again, as we've seen, a lot of interest in the site, um, but not a whole lot of actual enrollment until mid to late November. And uh, so we'll be monitoring this very closely to, to make sure that we get on track. Um, so there is some delayed functionality, and attachment A uh, includes a list of that delayed functionality. Most of those items were provided to the board in August and September, so that should not come as a surprise to anybody here. Um, there are a couple of items that we, we delayed, and I'm not sure if they're actually on this list or not, um, that, uh, for instance, there was a filter functionality that um, when we tested it uh, uh, like a, about three or four days prior to go live, the, it was creating an error on the, uh, the tax credit display. We removed the filter function so that that error does not show up in the web portal. Uh, I believe that filter function was put back in the system last night. It could be incorrect, um, so don't quote me on that. Um, but uh, I believe the, that functionality was put back in, um, uh, well, I guess you could because we're on the record, right? Um, <clears throat> was put back in last night, if not tonight, uh, last night, then it will be um, it, within the next few days uh, with that display issue corrected. So um, in any event, the um, uh, those types of things that uh, that were taken out at the last minute to make sure the user displays correctly um, have been put back in or are being put back in. And, and so as we indicated um, the week before go live and to the press at 8 a.m. Uh, on October 1st, those that go on the web portal now will have a different experience than those that go on the web portal in another three weeks to month. Uh, we continue to improve the system. We continue to resolve errors. Uh, we are getting uh, a lot of feedback from folks, both at the call center, on our social media sites, um, indicating that, that you know this issue is incorrect, that this issue is, is a problem. We take those issues up to Xerox, and, uh, and for the most part, they are being resolved. Um, again, resolution doesn't always happen within a day. Sometimes it takes three or four days to, to get these issues taken care of. We need to be able to know who, the, um, who was the person that it affected, when it affected them, we have to look at our logs. We have to identify the issue, identify the fix, test the fix, then push to production and test it. So there is a process that's in place, and, and so we're working through that. Um, so, so anyways, you can see the list of delayed functionality that is uh, in attachment A. Um, so now that we are past the major implementation, and again, we've said for a while now that we will be continue, we will continue to implement for a while, we will continue to test for a while and introduce new tools for a while. Um, but but now that we are past 10.1, we now have to really make sure that our focus is on outreach, education, <clears throat> and actually getting those enrollments. So um, so you may have noticed if you've been to our stakeholder site, exchange.indy.gov, the counter has been reset. It was counting down to October 1st, and um, I happened to be up at right before midnight and thought I'd watch it count down to zero and see what it would do. I, I thought it would be so exciting, but it was really anticlimactic. It got to zero and it just stopped. Um, so, uh, in any event, um, we have reset that counter uh, to the days till December 15th, 2013, and today there are 65 days to go. That is the number of days that people have left to enroll in coverage that is effective on January 1st. So um, <clears throat> we would like to um, issue a challenge to brokers and navigators. And uh, if you mind, they can't do this until they get their broker, broker codes over the next couple of days. But um, for each of the next 65 or 63 days, whatever it is when you get your code, um, <clears throat> we would like brokers and navigators, um, agents, enrollment assistors, certified application counselors to enroll two people per day for each of the next 65 days. Um, we think that, that uh, two people per day is, is fairly reasonable, although <clears throat> that can be difficult when you're also including uh, weekends and holidays, so we've got the, the Thanksgiving holidays coming up. Um, but uh, it, it is a, a lot of work, um, <clears throat> but if we can get two people per day per broker and, and navigator, we, we do think that we'll be able to meet our enrollment targets. Um, so with that, I'll be happy to take any questions from the board.
Do we have any questions, uh, members, to the executive director? Can I make it? Sure. And Ms. Uh, Darus wanted to make a comment. Go ahead, please. So um, Ms. Atkins pointed out that in the executive director's report on page two and then on page three, the same number of calls was recorded on October 1st and October 8th of calls received. It says 1,707 calls on both pages. So the, the number for statistics for October 8th at 4 p.m. should be 7,961 calls at by 4 p.m. that day. So I just want to make that change. Thank you. How about questions from board members? Lynn Atkins? Um, I have a couple questions. John, thank you. This is just like so much going on, and I think <laughs> under the circumstances, I think yay to everybody. <laughs> so congratulations, everybody. Um, I have a question, uh, two questions about um, the assisters or the navigators. Is that function working yet on, on the uh, website to get assistance? I keep trying it. Is that not working, and when will that be working? So John pointed out. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So um, the where John was talking about the broker logins would go out, that is actually also the navigators and assisters. So we provided a, um, a list, a database, basically an Excel spreadsheet of everyone who has gone through our class and become appointed to the exchange. We have to provide that list to um, Xerox. They upload that information, and that's the information that will populate that. We put that in by zip code, so we keep saying people can look it up by zip code. Um, and that's the information. So it's happening now. So within the next few days, that information will be available. Excellent. Thank you. And then I had another question, and I'm sorry if I zoned on that. I apologize. Um, another question is I do see that there's a calendar of events, um, which is great. And, and I know I think care, a lot of the navigators are listening. I was wondering if there's any sort of an update on the numbers of people that are calling and scheduling appointments. If there's any sort of information we have on that. I currently do not have that information, um, but we can certainly gather some of those statistics. Um, you know, as the navigators and assister organizations have been kind of trying to get through, get on, um, our, that's really where our focus has been. They have not yet had to provide their monthly reports to the exchange yet. For the next board uh, meeting, we will have had those reports and we will provide you with that information. Absolutely. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Kerr, do you have any questions? No, thank you. Okay, and do we have Dr. Klein on the line yet? Doesn't sound like it. Okay. Um, then, uh, John, you want to walk through that attachment A with the uh, web portal? Sure. So there are um, several items that are that affect the front end, that affect users on the front end, and there are several items that are back end that are invisible to the user. Um, the front end items, there, um, there is some financial hardship exemption that an individual can get if they um, if they make a certain amount of money or if they've got some kind of financial hardship, they can show that the cost of the, the cheapest bronze plan is uh, <clears throat> is is too much based on their income, and they and uh, basically this this functionality will allow them to determine what the the cheapest bronze plan is uh, after they go they've gone through the uh, APTC enrollment process. Um, show what the cheapest bronze plan is for that person, and they can print that out, give that to HHS. That functionality is not available yet. Uh, that's scheduled to be available. Uh, we're we're hoping in the next couple of weeks here. Um, <clears throat> intent to reside, uh, that is for an individual who lives outside of Nevada uh, who intends to reside in Nevada. Uh, and, and so right now, that functionality is, is not available. We hope to again have that one available um, within, uh, hopefully within the month. Um, that one is a little more complicated because we have to work with the eligibility engine folks um, to, to make that one work. Uh, the out-of-pocket out cost estimator. Um, will allow a consumer to put in some estimated usage. It, it provides you a, a guess on, on what your total expenses would be, um, but not for the purpose of budgeting, but rather for the purpose of 
uh, sorting plans by most expensive plan versus least expensive plan or, or vice versa. So um, that functionality <clears throat> was removed because of certain concerns that the, the carriers had about the um, accuracy of this display. Uh, we are working on getting that functionality back up and running again sometime within the next few weeks. <clears throat> the Spanish language portal um, is uh, a fully translated Spanish version of NevadaHealthLink.com. It's in Lace de Seguro Medico Nevada.com. Uh, that will be available, uh, expected in mid November. Um, I, I have to say, I wasn't correct in a previous report. Um, well, I was, I was correct, but somebody else was incorrect. Um, I was told. Uh, by the feds that we were the only only state that was providing a fully translated Spanish portal. It turns out that we're not the only state. I know of at least Colorado. There may be some other states that are doing it. So um, and Colorado's was up and running. Um, so so uh, but in any event, um, that functionality will be uh, available in mid November. There is a click to call, click to chat function um, that will is supposed to also be available in mid November. Um, I I do need to point out that. Our Xerox team is at this very moment going through each of the uh, items on this list to confirm when they will be available. They're actually they're they're on they're doing a prioritization and scheduling meeting uh, as we speak, um, and so these these dates could um, uh, be pushed around a little bit. Uh, but the click to call, click to click, click to chat functionality. Basically, you click a button and uh, a chat screen would come up where you click a button and somebody would call you um, rather than. Uh, been having to call the toll-free number, which uh, is available on the website uh, at, on every web page. So it's it's uh, it's a um, it's an added fun, uh, feature. Um, sorting plans by cost and out-of-pocket cost. Basically, using the out-of-pocket cost calculator kind of goes with that piece to to sort the plans. There are functions already in there that will allow you to sort by premium, sort by deductible, um, to, uh, uh, sort by various. Uh, um, Plan design, um, uh, for sort by tier, etc. Um, plan searches based on prescriptions and providers. This functionality, uh, we we have a um, a way to look for your provider, and it actually comes up with that provider's name. Uh, you, you can put in the address, or you can search by by zip code for a person within you know five miles of your house or ten miles with uh, you know maybe it's a, a certain specialty. You can find your doctor, and it'll show which carriers that doctor is, um, which carriers that doctor is contracted with. Um, uh, what it doesn't allow you to do is specifically filter um, the plans by that functionality, which is, is something we'd like to have. Uh, again, it's just a, it's one minor step in in the direction we want to go. Uh, the, there is uh, relatively good functionality there though now, so you can find out um, that. Uh, there is a, a prescription drug finder and a, and a provider finder that's there and available. Um, it's just not automatically connected to the filter functions of the plan selection. Um, <clears throat> the, we would like to be able to uh, search or filter by the Medicaid, um, the managed care organization transition QHPs. Um, as at this point, uh, it, it will a person will be alerted to the fact that there is a managed care organization transition QHP that is the MCO equivalent when they terminate from Medicaid. Um, we'd like to be able to automate that functionality a little bit, um, and so we're, we're, um, we're we think that that will be available uh, at the beginning of next year. Um, this really isn't something that is is um, extremely important for uh, open enrollment. This is really for somebody that is coming off of Medicaid and going on to managed care. Um, QH, uh, transition QHP, uh, and then, so it's probably more of a, a middle of the year issue than it is an open enrollment issue. Uh, the tribal group billing and employer list billing functionality uh, is also expected to be available at the beginning of the year. The back end items, fast follow items. So the electronic data interchange, enrollment, and payment communication with carriers. <clears throat> there was um, there was a blog or an article uh, today that talked about. We weren't ready for that, and, and that is true. That is um, going to be ready uh, at the end of this month, um, and that will allow us to automatically communicate enrollments with carriers. Um, I believe that communication will happen on a nightly basis once that functionality is up. <clears throat> and so um, anybody that has enrolled from October 1st to the date that that functionality is up will all be sent over in batch 
um, that night that, it, that it's available so that the carriers have all the information that they need. Um, uh, keep in mind, again, uh, enrollment doesn't start, uh, or coverage does not start until January 1st. There is uh, really no need to have that information right now. Um, so we're working with the carriers to test that functionality to make sure it's available and that we can communicate with them <coughs> appropriately. Um, and then the remaining items, QHPV certification, is it's simply a process that allows us to flip the switch to turn a plan off uh, and to get letters out the door. Um, that uh, right now is, is a manual process. I don't anticipate having to use that functionality for a long time. Um, and so we'll, we'll see how that goes, but I cannot imagine having to decertify a plan given the level of communication that we've had between the Division of Insurance and the carriers and the exchange staff. <coughs> um, that carriers have been very receptive to uh, the requests that we've had, so I do not see a need to decertify anytime soon, uh, but that functionality needs to be available uh, at some point. Auto redeterminations and auto, auto renewals aren't necessary until the next open enrollment, so uh, at the end of 2014, and then the automated document management workflows, I've actually seen some emails going back and forth um, that portions of that are being implemented this week, and, uh, and that will continue to be implemented over the next several weeks. <clears throat> that simply allows the Xerox team to automatically pull up documents and, and supporting documentation um, through their uh, uh, case resource management system. Um, Right now it's more of a manual process and they've staffed up to make sure that they can handle the increased workload. So those are, in general, the fast follow items. Uh, again, um, along with those items, there are plenty of, of uh, bugs and issues that we've been working with. The public, um, as they come forward with issues, we, we bring them to Xerox and uh, we, we schedule a, um, a correction timeline for them. And so we're mo moving forward. Every day the system gets a, a little bit better. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hager. Uh, do we have any board members that would like to ask Mr. Hager about these follow fast follow items? Okay. And um, unless there are any other comments, I'm going to move ahead to agenda item number five, which is the marketing update by KPS3. This is CJ Bowden. I'll start this off. We're uh, bringing Stephanie Cruz in the north and Katie Coleman in the south up to the table. And we're, today we're going to go over what has happened since launch and proceeding up to launch for web portal, web traffic, our outreach update, the in-person touches that we received, as well as our timeline review, messaging waves, and the phase 3-3, three, three, which is like launch. With that, I'd like to hand it over to Stephanie Cruz at KBS3. Well, actually, we're going to hand it over to Katie Coleman of KPS3. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, for the record, Katie Coleman, KPS3 Marketing. And um, Athena in the in the Carson City office is actually going to pull up the presentation on the overhead. If you could do that, that'd be great. And then is this, uh, we have paper copies here, is that correct? For board members, um, we do have copies at... Um, at each of your seats. So if you want to look at that instead of looking at the screen. Great. So um, with that, Athena, if you could uh, proceed to the slide that says web analytics. That's slide number three. That'd be great. And um, we're going to start again with web analytics. Um, we're taking a look at the analytics behind the informational site. Um, this is the site that uh, is still in existence, but was uh, the informational site from July 1st until September 30th, up until the go-live date on October 1st. Um, we are looking at 110,819 visits. Um, 74, 493,000 of those were unique visitors. Uh, we had 500,080 page views, 4.51 pages per visit, and an average visit duration of 4 minutes and 14 seconds. So to, to kind of give some context to that, um, uh, let's see. So the, this data shows that positive indicators tell us that the users have been actively engaging with the site up until the go-live date, rather than merely going to the home page and then moving on. The age category that he was concerned of that went up to age 65 was covered by those same types of media buys. 
we're very confident that the age group that is right up to 65 is also covered by the demographic, even though it didn't list it explicitly. How can we ensure um, coverage, and this would be a question for staff as well, at senior events? Um, I don't know if there could be some sort of coordination by Mr. Gold or someone else from AARP giving advance notice um, so that we can ensure that there's someone there, there's brochures present, um, because that does seem to be a very important population. And okay, Stephanie Cruz, for the record, we, we have not been focusing on the senior population. We've been, we've been prioritizing other populations that we identified through research as probably needed to put resources. Doesn't mean that we can't do that in the future. If we know that we, at a, in quote, senior event, will have population that is not covered by Medicare, we just would love to know about it and hear a little bit more about the population. So. If we said no accidentally to some place where we knew there could have been some additional target audience for us, we can certainly do that with our outreach team. And, and he has been wonderful in taking our brochures and posters, and again, we thank him for distributing those to his populations at his own events and his uh, conferences that he has. And then to address the second uh, concern about the, the wording used on the television ad about avoiding a fine on the taxes, Again, in a 30-second television spot, we focused on that because that was something that was made very, very clear to us by our target population. Um, they, when we held our focus group and we told them about the changes in the law, they had no idea it was coming. And when we told them about the fine on their taxes, they were adamant that we needed to tell them that in our messaging. Um, as we went into a 60-second spot, we also added the financial subsidy possibility pre-existing conditions. And so I think as we moved into phase three, because we have longer television spots and because we've evolved our messaging, we're not focusing only on the fine and the taxes, but we felt it was our duty to let the consumer know that that was part of the healthcare law and it was something that they had to prepare for so there wasn't surprises. Do we have any other questions? Ms. Edkins. Um, two, two questions. Of the three commercials, the, is the second commercial considered phase 3A and is the second commercial running October 7th to November 3 and then the third commercial is running November 4th to Defe December 15th, is that right? Correct. Um, so if I could just say that third commercial, in my opinion, was head and shoulders above the other two, just head and shoulders. I think it had a much more positive message. It did not even talk about the fine. It was. It was so terrific that uh, it would seem to me that the value of using that now would be good. I don't see why we would need to continue to use that second commercial, which I know the working group was kind of struggling with as well. So I don't know if that's possible. Maybe nobody agrees with me, but <laughs> you know, um, that third commercial just really to me hit the mark and um, I would suggest using that now and not using the second commercial. I agree with you. I think uh, the third commercial is head and shoulders above, you know, the second commercial. Uh, for the record, John, here, Ms. Cruz, the, um, the second commercial that we saw, it, it looked an awful lot like the first one. I didn't, I didn't notice the change. Was that the actual first one twice, or was there a difference that I missed? There's a slight difference in, Stephanie Cruz, for the record, the, there's a slight dif difference in the call to action at the end with a bit of an urgency okay. close before the December 15th. So it. it still used a lot of the same language as phase two, but it, it changed the call to action slightly. But it did, it did not incorporate some of the suggestions of the working group in terms of the additional footage and giving it a little bit more lively feel, so. You know what, and, and just for my comment as well, I think the second commercial, because the change was at the very end, you're going to lose people's attention because they think they've already seen the ad and they'll walk away from it. So I, I, I agree with everyone. The third one really caught my attention more than the other two. I have one other question um, unrelated. Is it, are, are we going to get, um, and maybe we can't get, but um, demographics of people actually signing up? So are we going to get a sense of the age groups and all the demographics so we can kind of see what's going on? Absolutely. This Chandra is for the record. Absolutely. We are. So first of all, we know their age. We know things like that. They have to answer those questions. Um, demographics for um, race or ethnicity are optional. Um, we don't require those. But if they put them in, 
we will have it and we can report on those. And so, I, I have one question, if I might, Pri. There's um, Stephanie or Katie, and I'll draw you back to the um, the PowerPoint that you did, it's on page nine and page four. And I realize this is only taking it up through September 30th, but um, does it concern you on the number of visits from the Hispanic uh, site that it's only 8,000? I mean, that really is our target group. And does it concern you to see how few kits there are compared to over on the English side? Um, I'd be happy to address that. Um, at first glance, yes, but uh, there's actually State of Nevada uh, shows, and CJ, you'll have to remind me of the exact, exact percentage, but State of Nevada's a uh, very high percentage of the Hispanic population is bilingual. And so um, we believe that um, a lot of those visitors are using the, the English site as well. So we're, we're reaching our target population. They're just likely included in the, um, the uh, metrics that go along with the English site. For the record, C.J. Bowden, yes, when we go through the demographics that are there, we have 89.5% of the Hispanic community in the state of Nevada being bilingual. So they speak English and Spanish. So 89.5% of that Spanish-speaking population also speaks English, so they will go back and forth between the two mediums. And if we look at that, we're looking at a, a smaller percentage. But it is uh, interesting, and we have been, especially with the outreach campaigns and then the door to door, we are targeting the uh, Spanish speaking members of our community. Where's that data from? Yes. That they're, bi that they're bilingual. We have that through our very first, it's in our uh, strategic brief. Right. It, uh, this is Stephanie Cruz. It was supplied through some of the uh, reports that were supplied by the prior um, consultant to the exchange in terms of that and we also use the demographic uh, websites that we use to, to, to try to get that. Plus, a recent study that was done that showed overall in the U.S. the number of people who are preferred just Spanish versus those who are bilingual. But it was it was initial demographic data supplied by an initial um, consultant to the exchange. It doesn't seem to correlate with what the school districts report in terms of. Uh, you know, they're English language learners, students, so uh, that seems to be a uh, kind of disconnect there. So when it, when is our Spanish-speaking site going to go live? About November 15th is the goal. Somewhere, oh, somewhere in November. Okay. I, I would continue to monitor that. I would think even if they're bilingual, <coughs> They'd be going more to a Spanish site than an English, although they have the capability of doing both. I was just concerned on seeing how few hits there were to it and wanted to make sure everybody was focusing on that. All right, do we have any other questions or comments? And Dr. Klein, you know, I'm here on the phone. Okay, thank you very much. Um, do you want to take a five-minute break here, or do you want to the next report? Is very, very short. And then okay. Hey, let's wind this one up then. How about going to uh, agenda item number six, the staff quarterly reports? Uh, so this, we'll oh, yeah. Before we start that, real quick. Um, so the statistic is from the um, uh, overview of the uninsured population provided by a public consulting group on August third, two thousand eleven. Uh, if you go to page eighteen. Spanish only spoken in, in the home. Um, it, it says 10.9% uh, uh, of the uninsured population in Nevada is um, is only Spanish speaking. So uh, I think that's where that that number comes from. I'm sorry. Uh, and that's based on the 2000 the uh, uh, 2009 residency status uh, report. U.S. U.S. Census Bureau. Okay, thank you, Mr. Hader. All right, let's go ahead on staff quarterly reports. For the record, Shauna Drews, um, I think Damon was planning to start on the, the fiscal report. 
before we, we did that, um, we do have some new staff members, or, or at least new maybe to some of you, um, and I wanted to point that out. Um, obviously, here in Carson City today, um, here, in Henderson, <laughs> here in Henderson today, uh, I got that from you, you never know where you're at. Um, obviously, you all know who I am. I wanted to make sure that everybody knew or met in person, possibly for the first time, Carrie Eaton. Carrie is our uh, benefits manager. Uh, recently, she came over from being our grants and projects analyst, uh, so she took on that new role. Um, Carol Myers, where's Carol? Uh, Carol <laughs> sitting at the front desk. There she is. Carol Meyer is our IT analyst. Uh, so some of you may be meeting her for the first time as well. Um, both of these two, in addition to their regular jobs, we all wear many, many hats. They are also, um, tomorrow we have our, uh, a broker training and an EEF training here tomorrow. They will both be helping me teach that class. So we, we came down to do that as well as the board meeting. And then, John, if you could um, introduce those in the north. So we have uh, Laura Rich here. Um, she is our quality assurance officer. Uh, we have um, Melissa Martinez, who uh, has been a temp for quite a while, but has just moved uh, into a permanent position. Uh, and uh, and then Athena is uh, our executive. Wave, assistant. wave at us. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, I think that I think those are the relatively new faces. Sure, if you don't, know, George is here on the back wall. George, are you here? Uh, uh, George, and then we've got uh, CJ and, uh, and Damon up here. Thank you, John. All right, so for the staff quarterly reports, my name is Damon Haycock, the finance research officer here at the Exchange. This report will reflect the first quarter of the state fiscal year ending September 30th here, 2013. And uh, to make this a very simple report, the spending is on track. We have included a chart on page two of how much uh, budget authority we have and how much we've spent to date. As you can see there at the bottom right hand quarter, excuse me, corner, there we spent a whole whopping 3% of our budget in the first quarter. So rest assured we will intend to expend the rest of it uh, post haste. The uh, effect of government shutdown on the exchange, that may be uh, a question on many board members and stakeholders' minds. We have received a letter from the Centers for Medicaid and Medica or Medicare and Medicaid Services advising us that we are funded uh, through appropriations for the first uh, federal fiscal quarter, that is from October 1st through the end of December 31st. So the lights are still on here at the exchange through the end of the year. Uh, what happens after that is anybody's guess. But that is the financial report for our exchange, and I will go ahead and turn this over to our communications officer, C.J. Bowden, to uh, discuss the outreach. Thank you, Mr. Haycock. You know, this, is, this report details staff outreach. This is staff outreach to stakeholders in the state of Nevada. Of course, it's picked up dramatically coming up to the October 1st deadline, and staff made about 40 presentations throughout the state of Nevada to approximately 1,800 stakeholders. The meat of our outreach, though, is done through our outreach team with KPS3 hitting the local and individuals out where they live, eat, and recreate. But as of this time, we did about 40 different presentations reaching 1,800 people throughout the state. With that, I'll be happy to take any questions. Well, you were right. See, wasn't that was a quick one? <laughs> any questions? All right, thank you. How about item number seven, discussion and possible actions regarding dates, times for future meetings? I, for one, can hardly wait to see some of the demographics and, and the update. I mean, we're only 10 days into it. It'll be good to see 30 days at least. For the record, so, I mean, it's, it's important to note that, that a lot of the information that the board would like to see, uh, I believe um, we, we brought some, <coughs> some um, dashboards. Uh, to the board in April. Those items are supposed to be uh, available on a monthly basis, so we're hoping to have that available at that board meeting. Um, there, the data that we get for September, or excuse me, for October, goes into a reporting database, uh, and then those reports are pulled out of that. So, um, so I hope to be able to provide that at the next board meeting. There is some delay in that process, uh, but we will get that out to the board as soon as they are available, and they will be published online as well. And our next meeting is November 14th. 14th. 
Ron Klein. Could I just step in and just say one thing real quickly? Yes. Hi. Sorry for, for participating this way. I just wanted to let everybody know um, that I've had the opportunity to hear from a lot of uh, really important uh, health policy people in Washington, D.C. on both sides of the aisle. And Nevada universally gets high marks for its exchange from everybody. Um, people only think about us as a tourist destination, and now they think about us as an exchange. So I just wanted to share that with everybody and, and give my compliments to to everybody at the exchange because you're doing a good job. You're doing a great job, and it's being noted nationally. Thank you, Dr. Klein. Any other comments? All right, before we move on to public comment, I personally want to thank the staff on the great job that they've done 24 7 for what the last two months almost i've attended a lot of the meetings with them a lot of the telephone conference meetings and i i can't tell you uh how proud i am of all of you and the dedication and time and commitment that you put forward on this i also want you to go home and thank all of your families because they've given to the state in letting you come work for us 24 7. And to the Xerox staff, thank you so much for getting us where we are. A lot of more work to do, but thank you very much. We extend that on to your staff and their families as well. So with that, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Um, do we have any public comment on the telephone? Does it sound like it? How about in Carson City? It doesn't appear so. Okay, how about here in Henderson? For the record, once again, my name is Barry Gold, and I'm still the Government Relations Director for AARP in Nevada. Um, I don't know what the process is for switching directly to that third commercial, but we've really heard some strong support from that from some of the board members, so I'm hoping the staff might go to KPS3 and say, hmm, let's think about this, and maybe next time we'll hear that, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. So I just came from a two-day meeting with 43 AARP state office people, and we talked about healthcare marketplaces um, for mostly, and they all refer to Nevada as a model from going back to our enabling legislation to the structure of the board to the staff involvement and they really talked a lot about the consumer involvement, how important the consumer involvement was before the whole thing really started, into the participation in the advisory committees, in the different groups and the people that participate. And they really talked about that a lot. And they were really, really pleased. And they came to me and said, Barry, how come it's working so good in your state? And so I just wanted to pass that along in the same kind of things that you said, is it has been a very good process. We are looked at as a national model. And hopefully as we move forward, that will continue. I think it will. Um, and people are very pleased and they look to us as a leader and that's kind of a nice thing um, to be recognized as a leader for something we're doing so well. So um, we want to thank everyone who's involved and we're all willing to work together because this is Nevada. Thank you. I appreciate that. I appreciate it for staff for you saying that, Mr. Gold. Thank you. Any other comment here? With that, again, thank you, staff, for all the hard work. Uh, we all appreciate it. We're all very proud of you. We adjourn until November 14th.